Hi guys, so what we're going to do is talk about clinical reasoning today and essentially what we're going to cover is the clinical reasoning process, talk about cognitive bias and how that might impact on our clinical reasoning and then go through some case-based examples. So let's start with a definition then. So clinical reasoning is the process where we create a diagnosis and management plan through using clinical information. So that's might be history, examination, blood test results, imaging, etc. Now I think most clinicians will agree it's it's not really a an exact science. Um, most cases we're using a, a sort of a best guess type approach, generally based on previous clinical experience uh, and weighing upper probabilities. And essentially this will lead to clinicians who review the same patient with the same information, creating different alternative differential diagnosis, different management plans, which doesn't mean that the clinical reasoning process is wrong. It just simply demonstrates that we're all human um, and we have different experiences to draw on and we're subject to different degrees of, of cognitive bias, which we're going to talk about later. Later. So let's move on and talk about the, the process itself. So there's several key stages in, in the initial assessment of a patient. Now, obviously, we always advocate an ABCD approach. We do that a lot in our, in our simulation sessions. And this is obviously very helpful when you're assessing unwell patients. But the, the key to the A to E assessment is understanding that it's not about gaining a thorough history or an examination. It's about buying physiological time. So you're essentially resuscitating an unwell patient and escalating their care early. It's not the same as a, as a thorough history and examination. So when we talk about clinical reasoning, really we want to be using as thorough a history, as thorough an examination as possible alongside appropriate investigations before creating a differential diagnosis and that management plan. Now there's four key sort of steps that we, we often talk about when we're looking at clinical reasoning. So the first step is collecting information. The second step is making sense of that information. And then the third step is creating a, either a problem list or a, a list of differential diagnoses. And then number four, you're essentially testing those differentials and coming up with a with a preferred diagnosis or a, or a list that you think is most likely. And essentially this is the underlying mechanism by which we assess and manage patients. Steps one to four, you just repeat over and over again as you gain new information from the history or from examination or from investigations. Continually testing and updating your preferred diagnosis or your preferred management plan. So how do you actually do this? I think that's part of the skill that you get as you move through your medical education. So sort of first and second year, you're very much just sort of taking a very standardised history and you're not really applying too much clinical acumen to that. So you just sort of go through the processes. And towards the later stages of your, of your medical career, you need to get better at picking out the key information. So you're not just going through the routine history for the hell of it. You need to get good at picking out the key you know, demographic details, so the, you know, what, what's important about that patient, you know, the age, gender, personal history, those important things. And then also problem specific details that are going to sway your differential diagnosis. So if, you, if you're seeing somebody with chest pain, for example, you want to know, you know, is it pleuritic, which might suggest a more respiratory cause? Is it there in a particular position, which might sway you towards a diagnosis of possibly pericarditis or reflux or something like that? And then through those key bits of information that you've gathered from your assessment, you need to create a list of, of differential diagnoses. Now, I'd always advocate keeping this list broad initially because it's important to in, in that initial differential diagnosis is include things that you think are very likely but also include things that you think are po possibly less likely but quite serious and things that you don't want to miss so for example when I'm seeing somebody with back pain it's important always in the back of my head to, to think is this a, an abdominal aortic aneurysm I might not think it's particularly likely but if I miss that diagnosis that could be highly significant for the patient and so it's important to have those serious but less likely differentials in your head and then essentially once you've got that list you need to use the the negatives and the positives from that key information to help direct you towards particular diagnoses and then reorder your differentials appropriately and we'll go through this process in a bit more detail when we go through the cases at the end but i'd just like to talk a little bit now about bias and cognitive bias because it's quite a, an interesting area of sort of, of, of human factors and, and clinical reasoning generally well, essentially what cognitive bias is is when a clinician favors a particular diagnosis or a particular treatment through a decision making process that relies on different sort of essentially prejudices, uh, different inclinations, different thought processes instead of relying on logic or the clinical information available. Now, cognitive bias itself is a is an overarching term, and there are lots of lots of subtypes. Professor Google found over fifty different subtypes of cognitive bias. There's far too many to go through, but I picked out a few of the key ones that we're just going to go through now. So, primacy bias is essentially where the the information you get first has the most weight attached to it. So, if you give an example here, so we talk about a patient with COPD presents with acute onset breathlessness. Now, immediately that makes you think the breathlessness is due to the COPD. As you gather more bits of information through your assessment of that patient you've already placed a lot of weight on the fact that they've got COPD almost to the detriment of other potential differentials so that's primacy bias the second one here is is anchoring bias 
So this is where you give more weight to a particular feature learned early on, and then you weigh up the additional information that you get based on how it fits with that original feature. So there's an example here that talks about a patient who's got a red ankle, and we learned that one week ago, they had a long haul flight. So immediately your initial differential anchors towards a deep vein thrombosis because of the presence of that one risk factor. And actually as you go through assessing that patient, you might learn that they've got a temperature, but because you anchored heavily on that DVT diagnosis, you think, well, you know, low grade fevers are possible in, in, in venous thromboembolism. So that, that temperature may well be due to a DVT. And you've anchored on that initial diagnosis, again, to the detriment of other diagnoses. And then moving on similarly, confirmation bias is it's kind of similar to anchoring bias, where essentially once you've reached an initial diagnosis, the rest of the information is deemed useful or not, depending on how it fits with your original diagnosis. So using that same example of that erythematous leg, once you've made that diagnosis of, of a DVT, again, we've got some blood tests here that show there's a very raised CRP, white cells are a little bit raised, mildly raised D-dimer. So you've used the D-dimer as confirmation that your original diagnosis is correct and deemed the CRP and white cells less useful because you've confirmed on that DVT. Another form of bias that we talk about is diagnostic momentum. So this is where a diagnosis made by one clinician is accepted as correct and you don't really look at the original information used to, to create that diagnosis. So the example here is where clinician A makes a diagnosis of, of urinary tract infection of UTI after seeing a patient with, a, with some dysuria and some hematuria and they give them some antibiotics and then clinician B comes back later symptoms are ongoing antibiotics haven't worked and they accept the original diagnosis without really assessing that patient thoroughly enough and they prescribe a second course of antibiotics largely based on the diagnosis of the first clinician and actually you miss that the patient has hematuria because of a bladder malignancy because you're not adequately assessing that information outcome bias is where a diagnosis is made because because it either has a sort of a, a you know, better prognosis or the treatment plan is, is essentially easier to do. So again, if we stick with that, that example of the, of the potential UTI, prescribing a course of antibiotics and saying we say you are in a week is a lot easier than having a very uncomfortable discussion with a patient saying this may well be a cancer, completing a two-week week referral. Attribution bias is where a diagnosis is made that can be attributed to the patient's fault, essentially the patient's behaviour, often negatively. So for example, you know, drug and alcohol abuse is the thing that springs to mind. So if, if we look at an example here, so you have a, an alcoholic patient who presents with a with a low conscious level, a reduced GCS, they smell of alcohol, and you make a diagnosis of it's alcohol intoxication, and you sort of put them to one side and, and wait for them to sober up, and actually you miss the subtle head injury that is actually the cause, and they've actually got a, an intracranial hemorrhage that's causing their GCS. And the last form of cognitive bias we'll look at is triage bias. So this is where the, the location that you see the patient in influences the diagnosis, investigations and management. For example, if somebody presents to a GP surgery with chest pain, that's managed very differently to if they present to an emergency department with chest pain, where before you've even finished the phrase, I have chest pain, you're pinned down and an ECG is taken. So the natural question then is, if we know these things exist, how do we combat them? How can we try and prevent them influencing our decision-making processes? And the answer to that is, is, well, it's very difficult, unfortunately. But they do have some techniques that we can employ to get around this. I think the first concept is the theory, I suppose, of, of metacognition, which sounds a little bit hippie-ish, but is essentially having an awareness of these diagnoses, having an awareness of the fact that we are human and we are susceptible to these biases. It just means that we can recognise them in ourselves as we're seeing our patients and thinking about their differentials and their management plan. I think on a more practical level, what I like to do in practice is just sort of take a step back when you can. So come away from the patient, come away from that hectic environment if you can. And just think, certainly if things aren't adding up, just think what else could be going on? Is there any other clinical information that, that doesn't necessarily fit with my differentials or my preferred diagnosis? And if so, why is that? Is the information correct? Do I need to go back and ask the patient more questions or examine another bit of their anatomy or do another investigation? But I think certainly from an F1 or F2's perspective, the easiest thing that they can do to try and avoid some of these biases is get a second opinion from a senior. Very simple, very quick. And you can just essentially compare your decision making process with that of your senior. But don't be afraid to, to say, just for your learning, how did you get to that end point? What information did you use to, to sway you towards diagnosis A as opposed to diagnosis B? Because that will just help with your development as a, as a junior doctor. Mm -hmm.